it was evening, and a man came with the news that Chariot's father, Ariston, had fallen from a ladder on his farm and was very unlikely to live. When Chariot heard this, much as he loved his father, he was even more distressed at having to go off by himself because he could not yet take his bride out. During that night, although no one went so far as to pay an obvious riotous visit to the house, they did come secretly and unseen, and left evidence of a party about. They hung wreaths about the porch and sprinkled it with scent. They soaked the ground with wine. They scattered half-burnt torches around. Dawn broke. People are generally inquisitive, and everybody who passed that way stopped. Charius, whose father was feeling better, was hurrying to his wife. His first reaction when he saw the crowd at his door was one of surprise, but when he found out why they were there, he ran in like a man possessed. He found the bedroom door still locked and banged violently on it. When the maid opened it, he burst in on Calerio. His anger gave way to grief, and he tore his clothes and began to cry. She asked him what had happened. He stood dumb, unable either to disbelieve what he had seen or to believe what he did not want to believe. He did not know what to think, and as he stood trembling, his wife, who had no idea what had happened, begged him to tell her why he was angry. His eyes bloodshot, he said in a voice hoarse with passion, It is what has happened to me that I am crying about. You have forgotten me straight away, and he reproached her with the riotous party. But she was a general's daughter and a very proud girl. She flared up at this unjust accusation and cried, There has been no riotous party at my father's house. Perhaps your house is used to parties and your lovers are upset at your marriage. With these words she turned away, covered her face, and burst into tears. But lovers are easily reconciled. They gladly accept any justification from each other, and so Carius changed his tone and began to talk winningly to her, and his wife quickly welcomed his change of heart. This increased the ardor of their love, and the parents of both thought themselves lucky when they saw how well their children got on. Faced with failure at his first plot, the man from Acragas now embarked on a more effective plan, thinking up the following trick. He had a follower who was glib of tongue and fully endowed with social graces of every kind. He told him to play the part of a lover. His job was to follow the feet of Clara Ho's personal maid, the most prized of her servants, and gain her love. She was reluctant, but he was insistent and managed to win her over by giving her handsome presents and saying he would hang himself if he did not get what he wanted. A woman is easy prey when she thinks she is loved. Well, when he had laid the groundwork, the director of this drama found another actor, not as ingratiating as the first, but a cunning, plausible fellow, and rehearsed him in what he was to do and say quietly, and say, and quietly got him to approach Chereus, who did not know him. The man did so as Chereus was strolling idly around the palestra. Chereus, he said, I once had a son myself, of your age. He was a great admirer of yours and very fond of you when he was alive. Now he is dead. I count you as my son. Indeed, your happiness is a blessing shared by all Sicily. So let me talk to you when you have a moment to spare. I have something important to tell you, which affects your whole life. By talking like this, that this wretch set the young man's mind agog and filled him with hope and fear and curiosity. When Chereus begged him to speak, he held back, saying that the present moment was not suitable and that they should put things off until they had more time to spare. Chereus began to suspect something serious and insisted all the more. The other grasped his arm and took him off to a quiet spot. Then he frowned, assumed a sad expression, and even let a tear drop from his eye. Chereus, he said, it distresses me to have bad news to give you. 
I have been wanting to tell you for some time, but cannot bring myself to do so. But now that things have reached the point where you are be openly abused and the scandal is public gossip, I cannot keep quiet. I detest wickedness anyway. That's my nature. But above all, I am well disposed toward you. Know then that your wife is unfaithful to you. To convince you, I will let you watch her lover comprise, compromise himself. At these words, a black cloud of grief covered him. With both hands, he took dark dust and poured it over his head, defiling his lovely countenance. For a long time, he lay dumb, unable to speak or raise his eyes from the ground. When he managed to find his voice, a small voice, not like his normal one, he said, It is a wretched favor to ask of you to let me see my misfortune with my own eyes. Show it to me, though, so that I have better reason for killing myself. For I will not harm Calerijo, even though she is doing me wrong. Say you are going off to the country, said the other, and when it gets dark, watch your house. You will see her lover go in. They agreed on this. Charias sent a message. He could not bear even to go into the house himself. To say he was going off to the country, and the villainous author of the slander set the scene. So, when night fell, Charius went to keep watch, and the man who had seduced Claire Ho's maid darted into the lane. He adopted the manner of a man who wants to keep his business secret, but in fact did everything he could do to be noticed. His hair was gleaming and heavily scented. His eyes were made up. He had a soft cloak and fine shoes. Heavy rings gleamed on his fingers. Then, after much looking about him, he went to the door, knocking softly on it, and gave the usual signal. The maid, who was very frightened herself, quietly opened the door a few inches, took his hand, and drew him in. When he saw this, Charias could not restrain himself, no longer, and rushed in to catch the lover red-handed and kill him. Now the lover had hidden by the outer door, and he slipped out at once. Clarejo, however, was sitting on her bed, longing for Charius, so sad that he had not even lit a lamp. Footsteps sounded. She recognized her husband before anyone else did, by the sound of his breathing, and ran joyfully to him. He could not find his voice to revile her. Overcome by his anger, he kicked her as she ran to him. Now his foot found its mark in the girl's diaphragm and stopped her breath. She fell down, and her maids picked her up and laid her on her bed.